All right, welcome back, everyone. I have got a special uh, surprise here on the bench today. I know I promised I was going to work on something a little different. Uh, I think I said last week. Yeah, that was optimistic of me. A lot of other things have been going on, working on my car, etc. Uh, I was at a radio club meeting here just recently, and one of the members was trying to fix this Philco 3955 a mystery control set for a uh, friend of his. And according to him, the set was working, and then it abruptly stopped. And all they can figure out is that the primary side of the transformer has no voltage going to it, no line voltage. There is uh, nothing at the socket of the AD rectifier tube, no plate voltage and no filament voltage. Uh, so that's not great. So, I tried taking a look at it, couldn't quite get very far with only having the multimeter on hand at the meeting. So, we talked about it, and uh, he offered to let me take it home and see if I couldn't get a better perspective of what might be wrong with it, because I do actually have a mystery control set in my collection. I haven't worked on it, so this will be sort of uh, my first introduction to these sets. Uh, these are actually really neat, because these are the very first commercial remote-controlled devices that a U.S. consumer could get their hands on. Uh, Philco actually introduced the mystery control system at the World's Fair in 1939, along with, I want to say the 3955 was actually the introductory model, or maybe it was the 39116. I can't quite remember. Uh, they would produce these sets for a few years, uh, but they would sort of quickly f uh, drop the mystery control system as it does require an additional piece of hardware and a battery pack. And that's not something I'm going to get into today. I do have all that. But all you need to know is these sets are effectively two radio receivers in one. So on the right side of the chassis, from my perspective anyway, we have a pair of 42s and push-pull, the 80 rectifier, and then a 6Q7, 1, 2, 3... Let's see... Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4... Yeah, all you really have is a 6-2 a six two AM set on this side. Everything else over here on the left, uh, these four tubes over here are purely a specialty radio receiver for the actual remote. Uh, the cabinet of the radio actually has an additional loop antenna built into the bottom uh, around the feet, and it connects to a pair of terminals on the back here. There's a sensitivity control uh, knob at the back so you can adjust how... Uh, how far away you can pick up the signal from it. Philco claims you could work it up to 60 feet. That seems to be a bit of an exaggeration given that the battery pack in the transmitter was only about 67 volts and uh, one and a half volt filament. Either way, you have uh, the receiver and then you have a 2A4 or uh, yeah, 2A4 thyrotron, gas thyrotron here that drives an electromechanical system in the radio to control the major functions. So with the remote, you can select one of several different uh, preset stations. In fact, there's a octopus of light bulbs here hanging off the front because on the front panel of the radio there's actually an extra piece just below the dial with a whole bunch of radio station uh, nameplates. You can put in little paper holders for them. And there is a stepper uh, motor switch underneath the chassis we'll take a look at in a moment that will select between which one of those preset stations you want uh, when you send it from the remote and it can also operate the volume control and the way it does that is with a, with a low voltage motor and you can hold down the remote control uh, has an additional button that allows you to send a continuous signal a stream of pulses effectively and that will allow you to uh, spin the volume up or spin the volume down. And like on most radios, the power switch is tied to the volume control, and so if you spin the volume control all the way down, it shuts the set off. What is a little bit unique about this is that in order to turn the set back on, of course, you have to get the motor spin forward. To facilitate that, uh, these radios actually have the motor drive control totally separate from the power switch. So 
uh, the there's a there's a low voltage transformer. This one right here, right next to the main power transformer. This little guy is responsible for providing the low voltage to the the uh, the volume control motor uh, output transformer over here. And then there is supposed to be well, the schematic claims that there's an additional tra okay, there's an initial transformer hiding over here actually, that is for filaments. I'm not sure if it's for all of them, given its size, maybe. But it, uh, it it seems to indicate they added an additional transformer, given that this one, it's not very big. That's possible. Well, actually, no, I shouldn't say that. It is pretty beefy. Uh, but what we need to do is we need to flip this thing over, and we need to take a look underneath and try and trace out what might be wrong. Uh, I have my... Uh, Writer's Perpetual Troubleshooter book flipped open to the page we need. So I am going to figure out how to stand this thing up on its end so we can get a better look underneath. Okay, so this side of the radio here is our power supply region. Got our transformer here. We've got this this apparatus over here is actually the if I remember right, that's this is the selector switch that controls between whether you're using uh, the front panel control or whether you want to enable the remote to take control of things You do actually have to set the remote control to on before you can use it uh, rather ironically and then Over here we have the volume control with the power switch and we have the motor that drives it So what I need to see is here's our power cord coming in we have hot and neutral, and those are coming into here. Uh, they've installed a fuse into the circuit, and then there is a, let's see, this is supposed to be one of the main transformer connections, and this is supposed to be one of the main transformer connections. Now, Philco used rubber wire in damn near every part of the, uh, actually I shouldn't say that, they used rubber wire in every part of this, and it is all flaking off really badly. Um, just the, the wiring coming out of the transformer has hardened and brittled and a lot of it has already been covered back over. What I want to see first and foremost is I'm going to pop the fuse out here. We're going to lift this block up. It is making good use of a pre-existing attachment point because what I want to see is underneath here. So there's a lot of wires, they're all in very close proximity and I want to make sure they're not touching. So one of the things that I noticed while looking at the schematic for this is that the motor over here that drives the volume control and switch uh, does not come directly off the primary of this. It's not 120 volt driven. It has a transformer here to provide a lower voltage to operate it at. RCA used um, a similar motor to operate their automatic tuning on sets like the 811, 813, and 816Ks. Those were about 24 volts, uh, and I believe these are AC motors. They just have multiple windings. They they have they're, they're, uh, they have effectively four windings, two of which are held in parallel. All four of them share one common connection, and uh, you can energize uh, the other two individually for forward and reverse operation. And the uh, volume control switch is what actually does that, which provides the forward and reverse operation for this motor. So it spins the volume control all the way down, clicks and turns the set off, or it spins it up enough to turn the set on. Which is a neat feature unless the motor assembly dies and then you can't ever turn the radio on and it doesn't matter whether you want to use a remote or not, you can't turn it on at all. So, uh, sometimes the engineers don't always think things through. Happens. What I want to see... is what is the overall condition. So here are the wires coming out of the back of the switch. So this is our connection. So this one is going to here, this one is going... That wire is splitting right down the middle.
after a bunch of futzing around and finally finding a working meter. Let's check what that's saying. Um, 42, 43-ish ohms. Find a clean spot. Okay, what's the manual say? Uh, about 45. Okay, so that's good. Now, the real question. What about the secondary winding? So near as I can tell, there are three terminals on this motor, one of which is one end of this transformer is supposed to be connected to ground on the other side. And one of it, one wire, is supposed to go and they go around the transformer back over here, this twisted pair. This one terminates here and this one goes to the center terminal of that. Now this is saying it's supposed to ground. I am not seeing any indication that that is actually uh, the case here unless this odd brown wire right here which goes into this sheath here oh man that sound is just good gravy okay just to just to satisfy him my curiosity. We'll tie that here and we'll tie this here. How far away from ground are we? Uh, no, that is in fact grounded. Okay. So that's good. Now what we need to see is do we have continuity on this side of the transformer? Four and a half ohms. And the manual states 4.2. Uh, they were most likely using a 10,000 ohm per volt ohm meter, whereas I am using a digital multimeter, so things get a little bit different. Now what I want to see is what the value should be on the primary side of our motor here, which they do not state. That is moderately unfortunate. Hmm. Now all they're doing is the switch that controls the up or down here is only grounding out one side or the other. So what I think we'll do is I will break out the variac here and let me go find a suicide cord. What I want to do is plug this in. Uh, we'll hook it up to just this transformer and since the other connections seem to be okay we'll just see if the motor drive is running and we'll eliminate any possibilities there. Okay, it's saying... 9 volts, 13, 14, 15, 16... Okay, which is the volume control switch? That's gonna be the far left one. This guy. Oops, nope, that's volume control. Oop! Look at that. Alright, so right there we just switched it off and it's got a clutch on it so that we can't force it too hard. And now if I go back the other way, Okay, set is now on. Return the volume up. Okay, so transformer and all that good stuff there is a okay. So that is all well and good. Uh, next thing to check does the switch actually work? So let's connect between here. I've got the Variac off for safety reasons. We're going to Disconnect these guys. Okay, and we're seeing maybe two tenths of an ohm. So the power switch is okay. So not the power switch, not a big deal. Um, 
Well, honestly, the next thing I want to do is remove these connections from the power transformer from that terminal strip and flex the wires out. We're going to slip some sleeving over them. I really hope I have uh, some of the right size. At the very least, I want to get those off of there and get that whole area cleaned up. Now, the next thing I want to do is we are going to apply 120 volts to this winding. And we are going to determine whether or not... Actually, before I do that, how much wire do we have on there? I'm going to clip off the parts of this that are sort of a basket case and get rid of them. There we are. They don't need that much. Make sure we have enough length to get back to where we need to. Yes, we do. Okay. Now, we can apply power. So here I am talking to a wall for probably a good half hour until I realize, oh wait, the battery in my camera died about a half hour ago. Uh, <laughs> welcome back, I guess. Um, I figured since you know, the camera batteries didn't have the charge up for a while that I'd just go for it and do a little more work on this. Uh, good news is I solved the problem. Uh, near as I can tell, uh, the issue was the primary winding connections of the power transformer here. The way that Philco did them from the factory, uh, like a lot of the other leads coming out of here, they uh, twisted them over each other, braided them over each other, and then ran them to the terminals. Well, in the process of doing that, they trapped one of these wires behind the other against this solder post. And of course, when they soldered it at the factory, uh, they melted the insulation a little bit. Uh, then I give a few decades later, the next person comes along, has to move things around, solders around it, warms it up again, and of course it's cracking and pieces are falling off. And as far as I could tell, it was just shorting right there, so... Uh, yeah, not, not great. But, um, I've put everything back in. I reorganized the positioning of these pieces, so... Instead of having the fuse block on top of this post right here, which this position actually, from what I can tell, had an original Philco Bakelite block in it with a line-to-line uh, a -line capacitor in it. I haven't put that in yet. I am going to. Uh, it did not have one uh, when the uh, other person worked on it. They didn't put one in there, so I'm going to do that anyway just because the schematic shows one. It's what he had from the factory. I might as well put one in there just in case. This is a fairly unusual set and just want to make sure it, it works well. Um, and we will actually test this out. I'm going to pull the speaker out of my unit uh, because mercifully Philco opted to put a plug on these instead of permanently attaching the speaker like on some of their earlier models. That aside, the way I have it set up now and I don't have a power cord hooked up to it yet is uh, this terminal here is for our hot connection. This terminal over here is for our neutral. And we've got power to the motor transformer on all the time, as per the schematic. And then the switch here is tied through an extension to the fuse block, and then from the fuse block back down to this guy here. So that all uh, works out very well. And then the neutrals are all uh, commonly tied together. Uh, one thing I did do, I've been going through the set, is I've started replacing a lot of the damaged wiring. Uh, I wasn't going to do a ton of it at first, however, there were two connections that go to the hot and neutral here that run all the way to the other end of the chassis to provide power to the filament transformer for the 2A4 Thyrotron, and I think that also provides some filament voltage for some of the other tubes over there. The schematic shows a few extra lines. And they weren't in great condition, and there are two uh, bendable steel uh, bands that hold all the wiring into one corner of the chassis, and they were cracking at those bands. And I, I don't have the sleeving large enough for the appropriate size to cover it, so I just figured, what the hell, brought out the 22-gauge uh, solid-core wire, because that's you know what it is, and just removed them and ran brand new ones. And there are still one or two connections where I'm going to do that. Uh, just for safety. So anywhere that looked like it had been 
it was rubbing against something or it was highly likely to get damaged. There was at least one wire on the other side of the chassis that loops around the tube sockets and was grinding against a ground connection. And just, just a recipe for disaster. So I dealt with that. Uh, I've got one more wire from one of these electrolytics over here that I'm going to run a new one that goes all the way over to this terminal block. Going to fix that. And then uh, I'm going to need to go into this corner and I think I'm going to have to unscrew this block with the motor assembly on it and scoot it out of the way a little bit so I can get to this 0.01 uh, uh, microfarad capacitor and this 0.01 microfarad capacitor that are hooked up between the uh, these 42s. Yeah, it's got the push-pull 42 output tubes. Which for 39, they must have had uh, a plethora of extras to not be using octals in that capacity. I mean, most of their companies were using 6F6s at this time. It wouldn't surprise me if Philco had leftover parts. I mean, they're still using an 80 rectifier. They must have had a lot of leftover parts. Uh, I'd be using legacy, legacy equipment like that. Either way, so yeah, I need to put in safety cap here. One other thing I am going to do is the schematic shows a 0.05 microfarad capacitor coming off of the neutral connection and going to ground. And the schematic shows it all the way back at the 2A4's uh, uh, hot connection. Uh, however, the uh, one that was put in here is a standard film cap. And since the line cord that's going to be going on this is grounded, I don't typically put grounded cords on these sets because they didn't have them from the factory. That's just, I, I try to make it more original, but in this case, it's going to a different customer. It, you know, it, it's it's what they had on there previously, so that's what I'll put on, um, and someone else down the road can change it out. But this cap right here, for the sake of peace of mind, I am going to use a Y-type line-to-ground capacitor since this is going to have an actual physical ground. So... Might as well uh, take a little bit of caution in that case. So I'm just going to leave that there so I remember it. It is too damn late to keep going. I will take another crack at this tomorrow, and I will see you all here then. Is there anything else? No, I don't think so. Oh, yes, I did power this up, and I tried it out. The motor drive and everything works exactly the way it should. The filaments come up on the tubes, which is great. I did not notice the dial lamps working, though. Uh, so once I get things dealt with and wrapped up down here, I'm going to flip the chassis over because this thing has a whole bunch of lights on it for the channel, uh, the uh, fixed, the, the electronic selectable tuning. So you got all these, these tuning slugs on the left side of the chassis here. This is your automatic tuning that you use with the remote control. And each one of the station indicators has a light bulb behind it. And those, it's just a, uh, an octopus wiring mess coming out of a part of the chassis here. Not this one. Uh, this one further over here attached to this great big rotary switch. And there's a lot of, a lot of heat shrink on them and a lot of spots where the wires are just damaged. And uh, I, I don't know. I think it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at it. I think I can, I can replace all of those. I have enough flexible, good colored wiring. I think I'll just... I'll make it a little cleaner. Okay, so before I go any further on this, I know I said I was going to replace a few more things. Um, I want to see... Whoops, that is monumentally stupid. Just ignore what I was about to do. Uh, I went and pulled the speaker. Is that in frame? Uh, yeah, it's, it's over here. I went and I pulled the electrodynamic speaker out of my 4216 Philco. And I've hooked it up to the chassis here because I want to do a quick function test uh, just to make sure I didn't screw anything up. I mean, I doubt I did. But just, to, just for peace of mind, I did replace a number of wires. And I'd like to ensure that I didn't make any big boo-boos because we haven't applied high voltage to this. And there's no telling if something got missed. Right, good enough as any. Okay, I'm gonna turn it on. Gently bring this up. I'm gonna do a quick function check and see. All right, I just turned it on. And uh, yeah, 
see what we get. That's 80 volts. and popping but where is my tuner now interesting I can see the 2A4 thyrotron glowing which is rather cool but I don't think that should be happening unless it's got a signal coming in now, a little Dynavite and her food helps Bella keep her beautiful coat with no scratching or smell. Never stop taking medication without first consulting a physician. Call right now for a free consultation. Call 800 379 Minor update. Uh, let's see, where do I start? Uh, oh, got this one piece of shielding metal out of the way because I needed to be able to move this clockwork arrangement out of the way. Power supply situation is all put back together. Uh, the two safety caps are in. We have the X type across the line here. We have the Y type going from ground to, in this case, the neutral, which it doesn't really matter. But I have a polarized 12 foot line cord on here that I've added. I know it's not grounded. I I don't ground my radios when I restored them. They didn't have them from the factory. It's it, honestly, it, to me, it's not that big of a deal. Um, I repositioned the fuse block. It's over here now. And I corrected the wiring so that everything that is normally powered by the 120 volt supply has to go through this fuse. So the fuse goes back over the terminal block for the transformer for the volume control drive motor as well as the connection for the power switch and the volume control unit which then comes back out to one side of the transformer the neutral is always tied to one leg of the transformer and the transformer over there so that's all of that now what I want to do is flip it over because I want to take a look at the wiring for the light bulbs that are on the chassis because those have the wiring on those is really really bad uh, in all fairness I suppose I should tuck this plate back into its little cozy home. I have a distinct feeling when I do my 4216 that this I'm going to be replacing a lot of wire. I haven't quite decided that if I'm going to go full bore on it though, I'll need to inspect it and see how bad it is, but I'm sure it's just as crunchy as all the wiring in this one. Oh, and there's the 2.01 microfarad capacitors that live in the abyss back here. One down in there and one over here. Those are in the uh, circuits for the 42 output tubes. I know earlier I said, I think I said 6 of 6. And these are, these are 42s. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, yes. So there are two of these hanging out the front here that have both a center connection for positive uh, well, they're, they're AC power. They have a center connection and they also have a grounded uh, outer connection. Now the bulk of the station indicator lamps here only have a center connection except for the very first one all the way on the left which does have a ground connection because there's actually a separate escutcheon for that assembly that has to be removed before the chassis can actually come out of the cabinet and that this first lamp right here is actually providing the ground for all the other seven lamps uh, kind of a goofy setup but there it is this one trails off into the abyss most of the rest of these appear to do the same um, these, these wires on these connections here are just, there's nothing really left of them. There's patches of heat shrink in places to try and save it, 
I think I'm going to cut my losses and just replace all of them. Now, they do have a little rubber, like a rubber boot. Let's see if I can... Yeah, so this thing shrunk and cracked all to hell, so that's junk. I think I should be able to push it up out. There we go. So this is pretty simple construction. There's a plastic washer, a spring, and then a contact in the middle that is soldered onto the wire. So... Yeah, this uh, spring's okay. All we really need to do... I think the last person I saw work on one of these, they actually just went to the hardware store and they bought a little plastic washer that was the right size to fit uh, just underneath this little contact here. And then you just put heat shrink over the bottom of it and there you go. Nothing too crazy. So we're just going to... I'm just going to peel all this junk off of here. There's no reason to say that there's nothing of any value left. So there's our little our little button on the end of it. All we got to do is hit that with some heat and it should come right off. And then we'll sleeve behind it with heat shrink. And then we will find an appropriately sized washer to put up in there that also has an OD just about the same size as this spring because it's going to need to be able to sit back inside. Hang on. It's going to have to be able to... Not for crying out loud, really? Well, it has to be able to sit back inside the housing here, so it has to be, you know, the same size to be able to sit in there comfortably and, and the center still the size has to be enough to fit into that brat and that should be pretty easy to accomplish. The only thing I don't know is... Well, I was going to guesstimate the wire length. I think it's going to be easier just to remove them one at a time and cut the new wire to the same length. Because these were originally uh, bound together and since each lamp was sort of in line next to the previous one, the wire bundle was wrapped rather nicely off to the left. So the wires are going to get, you know, very long towards the far right and shorter the closer to the left you get. And they're all different colors, which I don't think matters. Oh, wait a minute, did they number these? This one's got a five on the base. This one's got a one. This one's got a three. How about that? Okay, so all of the sockets have been conveniently labeled with a marker. I'll have to make sure to do that on mine. That's good. And these are number 47s. Okay. I have a few spares if there are any dead. Now, I do want to check something really quickly since we have the uh, these two tubes and that guy out of the way at the moment. I want to check the dial lamps up front for operation, because I was noticing that there was nothing really going on there uh, when I powered this up the first time. So I'm going to flip this on. I'm going to crank this up to normal operating voltage, and that is set power on with no rectifier. And nothing at the dial lights. Uh, okay. So these just attach with a very simple spake. Oh my god, those, those connections are trashed. Absolutely trashed. I'm gonna have to rebuild the sockets on it. Well, Maybe not. But they've obviously seen a lot of use. The ends are very, very... Oh, hang on. There's some life in there. The contact might just be really dirty. The only problem is I can't get this thing to... There we go. Yeah, I think the problem is the rubber in here is actually shrunk 
so badly that the spring that normally pushes the lower contact up to the bottom of the bulb can't make it all the way to the bottom of the bulb, so it's not even touching it all. So yeah, um, oh no, these are these are the riveted kind. I should still be able to repair these, I would hope. Mm. Oh, shit. Eh, we're going to have to turn that off real quick. There's breaks in the wire, so yeah. You have to replace the wiring to the dial lamps. You're going to have to rebuild all the sockets for safety and replace all the wiring to the front panel lights. Uh, so I will... I will get on to that shortly. Okay, update time. I don't remember where I left off, so we're just going to ignore that for continuity because I don't care. I've been doing some repair work on all of the dial lamps, and there are, what, 12 in this thing? 13? No, about 11 of them, sorry. So there are the eight selection uh, lights for the fixed stations for the automatic tuning on the remote side. Uh, two dial lamps up front, and then you also have the lamp uh, that goes into the jewel on the cabinet so that when the lid is closed, you can tell that the radio is still on if you've had the volume cranked down or something. So I've been going through and rebuilding each of the lamp sockets, and I thought I'd show you guys what exactly I'm doing for that. I got this from another uh, website blog talking about these. So this is the inside. Is that actually showing up? Yeah, this is the inside assembly from one of these lamps. So you can see the spring on the outside of this rubber uh, deal here. The actual lamp housing has some little fingers on it that allow it to socket into the face plate and this little wire just drops down through the top and the spring is captured by this rolled over section here. There's a lip. This whole thing is molded as one piece and on the inside of it there's a small brad. I think I showed that earlier. And that brad contacts the bottom of the number 47 light bulbs that are in here. So I'm going to peel that rubber off there and save the spring. And then I'm going to just rip the rest of this off because we don't need it. So all that is junk. And I am kind of sort of trying to match the colors back on these. So there you go. We've got our little brad on the end there. And all I do is I take my hemostat and I lightly grasp it around the middle and then I clamp this assembly into my vise. Uh, I just hit the top of it. This is just a solder dome and the wire will pull or drop clean free or you can remove all the solder, clean it up, do whatever. I touch it up with uh, fresh 6040 lead solder and the new wire just goes up into the base of that. So I will do that real quick here and then I'll show you what else we need. This, the only other things you're going to need for this, actually let me just grab them right now. Yes, I went down to my local McClendon's and I got uh, about 20 or so of these number 6 nylon washers. Uh, they're a little bit smaller on the OD than I wanted, but they do sit on top of the spring just fine. I tried number 8's, but the OD is too big, and the inside of these sockets is actually slightly tapered towards the bottom, it seems, and it will not compress all the way in there, and it'll just get stuck and the spring won't be able to push back up against the bulb, so that's no good. Okay, just off camera here, I'm going to remove this piece of junk wire. There we go. And this one appears to be, what do I have it marked down? Yellow? Yeah. And I don't have any yellow wire stranded, or well, I, I'm trying to keep all the wire for the lights the same instead of using something else, and this this stuff happens to be, I think it's still trailer wiring. And it works just fine for the given application. Most of what's in here appears to be a stranded 22 gauge, just looking at it. I think what I have here is probably closer to 20. But that is fine. What I was really aiming for was the thickness of the insulation is about the same as the original stuff. So that's what's handy about having a great big junk box full of random wire I save from different places. 
because you always have some in the size you need. And in this case, I had a decent assortment of colors. I do plan on actually buying a good proper set. I think from uh, Antique Electronics Supply, they have nice uh, 50 foot rolls for $10 in all sorts of different colors. The rubber tends to stay put on the back of these little center contacts. I'll try to get as much of that off there as I can. There. So there's our reattached one. You can do more cleanup if you want. Uh, ultimately, the uh, most of what I needed was to get good electrical contact with the center, which I have. I'm also going to reproduce the original wire length. Let's just match that up with the replacement. Since I don't have yellow, I'm going with white. Close enough. And I am giving these maybe a quarter inch more as a precaution. Now the, uh, these lights are going to curl up and sit right about here in a row. And number one is over on the far left and number eight is all the way here. So when it starts to cycle through, it'll start at the left and scan to the right and then reset. So the number one socket, let me actually show you this real quick, has a ground wire on it. The others do not. And what is really important with this is that this, this is not a ground connection. The Philco did some rather interesting little arrangement with the light circuit here. So when you're not in remote, uh, these lights have let me double check the schematic. I want to say one half of them are just ground out. So yes, uh, when you are not in the position, let's see, no, let's, hmm, this is uh, just ever so slightly confusing. They're fed from a 10 ohm resistor to the six volt supply. Interesting. I have to wonder if perhaps they may have made a bit of a boo-boo because some of the switch positions look like it should have ground on both ends. Yeah, that is strange. Um, either way, all of these are supposed to be ganged together. The faceplate that these socket into is steel. Or I think it's stamped steel or stamped aluminum. And this guy right here provides uh, the return for all of the other bulbs. So if you have them out like this, like I do, and you run the control circuit, only this one will actually glow unless you jumper them together. And that's what I'm going to do to test to make sure it's all working okay. I know mechanically it seems to be going, but of course I want to see the pretty lights flash and whatnot because I'm a simple person. Uh, now back to the wire I was repairing. Brad is on there. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to slip my little nylon washer over the end of it all the way up to the brad. And then I have some, what is this? 50% shrinkage, 3 16 inch shrink tube. And this is going to be our insulation for the springs. We gotta make sure that the spring does not make any contact with the exposed bottom of the center contact there. And the nylon washer provides plenty of protection towards the top. But there is just a little bit of it peeking out at the bottom. We wanna make sure we keep that covered. Okay, so protection, nylon washer's on there, and the shrink does tend to trap the nylon washer in place, so I kind of like that. I tried doing it the other way around and had to force the nylon washer over the uh, end of the uh, heat shrink, and it, yeah, 
not as good. Didn't seat as firmly down as it should. And then we just slip the whole thing back through there, drop it into place. Nice and springy, and I am missing a number 47 bulb. One of them must have already been out. And then, yeah, and then it's got plenty of tension to keep it in there. And now I just have to fish it through the hole tucked in the back of the chassis here and wire it up to the selector switch. But here are the other completed and numbered, thankfully, the last person that was working on this kindly numbered them all in sequence so I went by that and uh, against the schematic so those are all back where they should be wire color is more or less the same they're pretty faded so I, I had to wing it a few places I will say though getting these wires in here is a little tricky because the coils for the automatic tuning are right in the way of the terminals on the selector switch and it's even worse if for any reason you had to repair a connection going to the coils because the lower section is completely blocked by them okay i think we're ready for a final check of all the replacement lighting work so i'm going to go ahead and turn off the overheads and let's try out the Oop. Okay, that wasn't good. Okay, I want to apologize for cutting off earlier that uh, last attempt. I had a bit of a bit of a failure there. It scared the hell out of me. Uh, the two amp fuse that was underneath the chassis popped and shut the whole thing down, which was very good uh, for obvious reasons. I, I did some digging around the chassis trying to figure out what the hell went wrong with it. Uh, what I discovered is that the bias supply, the candom resistor that's mounted just uh, right here, actually, above these two transformers, was getting very, very hot. It was, the outside of the chassis was noticeably warm. I could, when I brought it up gently on the variac afterwards to do a little bit of looking around, I could, I could hear what sounded like sizzling bacon, effectively. And the transformers are all cool. So, as a just-in-case, I pulled the rectifier tube out and brought it up again, and all the lights worked and everything just fine. So, I did some probing around, double-checked the schematic, and what I discovered was, um, I guess the last person to work on this didn't quite pay attention to the schematic because... Uh, I can't even bring the writers over here. Uh, okay. Just bear with me on this. In most radio power supplies, you have... The rectifier tube output coming off the cathode as the positive connection, that goes into the first electrolytic, usually relatively small so you don't get a bunch of uh, startup current sucking on the rectifier and overloading it. Then it goes through uh, a fairly large choke, which in most cases with these sets is the electrodynamic loudspeaker's field coil. It makes a nice double for that. And then the output of that goes to the second electrolytic, which is usually a little bigger, and that goes on to the B-plus power supply for the rest of the tubes. Now, uh, you need bias supplies for these tubes to obviously bias them in the various circuits and whatever. And in uh, the case of most power transformer radios, the center tap from this for the plate supply comes off. You have a bunch of resistors and then they ground the end of that string of resistors. The first capacitor in the power supply circuit has its negative end tied to the center tap at the very head of that string, which in this case is the candom. The ass end of the candom is connected to ground, and the second capacitor in the power supply has its cathode grounded. So what that does is it uses the first capacitor to keep the bias voltages in this string um, relatively steady, and then the, each resistor in this candom has a tap to be picked off to go to wherever it needs to for the, the RF and IF sections. Uh, what I discovered was that in the replacement of the cap capacitors, I, I don't know if they just maybe had a had a moment where they forgot something, but they put two 22 microfarad capacitors in the B plus section there, and they just wired them both directly to ground, and the positive end of one was connected to the head of the candome, 
so effectively it, it was just it was it was all all kinds of wrong so when i when i measured the resistance of the b plus section i was getting 200 ohms from the rectifier tube cathode straight to ground which was blatantly wrong and would produce a very high surge current which would make sense why the resistor blew or the fuse in this thing blew so i traced it back I replaced the wire coming off the cathode to the first electrolytic. I dumped the two electrolytics that were in there and put in a brand new Nishicon for safety, and then double checked the wiring, brought it back up, and it works just fine. So what I want to do is actually show I've stolen the faceplate off of my Philco 4216 because I needed an easy way to hold all the damn lights in place uh, because they just flop around ordinarily. And I alluded to it earlier, but these lamps in here are not grounded to the chassis and I have to electrically isolate them. The faceplate is actually attached to the wooden cabinet and doesn't make physical contact with any of the chassis metal uh, because the sockets on these, like here's the jewel lamp on this one, on all of these the outside here is actually the positive, well it's it's AC but this uh, this is not connected to chassis, this is connected to one side of the filament transformer and all of these are fed through a 10 ohm resistor from the filament transformer and the switch for the selector grounds the center contact of each of these which means um, if we're grounding the chassis if I then gr if I try to ground the outside of this that I'm, I'm basically producing a dead short across the filament transformer for the tubes there's a 10 ohm resistor in there so it would take the load but nonetheless anyway I'm gonna bring this up on power and I'm just going to give a quick demonstration of the lights and everything cycling. I am going to do a dedicated video just to the, mis the Philco Mystery Control system. Uh, I can't do that yet because my Mystery Control remote is damaged. The spring is broken. So after I fix that, put it together, I'm going to do a video showing me making a battery pack for it. And I'm going to do a video overviewing the control system and how it works. Because it is really, really ingenious. Anyway, bring the Variac up. We are going to bring this up slowly here, and I'm going to turn off the lights because I don't remember whether I left this in the on or off position. So, okay. Dial lights are on. Rectifier is warming up. Turn the volume up a little bit. Now I have not done an alignment or anything to this set just yet because I wanted to make sure all the other systems are working. Okay, so the radio is working. I'm going to slowly bring this up to full operating voltage. I'm just trying to be as cautious as possible. This is going to be a little obnoxious if I have to hold the stupid faceplate in the whole thing. Okay. We're at full operating voltage. A little light up front's working great. Dial lamps for this are working great. And what we're going to do now is we're going to rotate this down to the remote position. Okay, we're in the television sound which I, I don't know what this thing is currently set up for. I have absolutely no clue. I would really like to have a way to not have to grab a hold of this. But we are working. I did have to clean all the contacts in the switch, which is why I'm trying to verify that all this is working right. And if I find my system over here, all right, there's the first position. All right. <laughs> Sweet. 
sweet. And oh, I should be able to op operate the volume control. So two should be volume up. Yep, and three should be volume down. So. Yeah, unfortunately, my station indicators are a little wiped out. I'm trying to see how fast technically you can do this. Pretty damn quickly. I don't know what the spacing between the pulses on the original remote were, but they are fairly close. So, that's fantastic. That is up and running. Um, obviously there's no stations tuned on this thing, so that doesn't, uh, isn't picking anything up, sadly. Nothing but static. But I think we'll finish this off here by shutting it down. And there we go. That is the 3955 Philco, and I'm just going to let this sit down here. There we go. So the, the assembly that actually holds the lamps is all part of the faceplate, so you can't leave this on the chassis, which kind of sucks. But uh, there's all our new wiring. It is a little goofy, the way it's set up on mine, all the wires are coming from the front because this arch section right here is actually there to avoid interfering with a uh, piece of wood on the inside of the cabinets. So the wires can't really come around the left and underneath, they have to go through the center. It's a little goofy, but it does work. But, we've got the remote control circuit on this working, I've got all the lights replaced, most of the important wiring has been repaired, uh, the B-plus circuit's working great, I just need to pop a brand new fuse in this, and I am going to call it done and try to get it back to the owner. Uh, they are going to see about getting me the remote control for this particular set, apparently the customer does have one, and it's going to need to have a battery pack built, and since I have to build one for mine, uh, see about building a second one, perhaps. Pretty simple to do. But uh, I appreciate you taking a look at this with me and uh, sticking with it through all the crap that I had to... all the shenanigans. So, uh, thanks for watching, and next time I hope to have a, a more in-depth look at this chassis, as well as a look at the remote and how to build a battery pack for the Philco Mystery Control. We'll see you later.